We've been engaged in a global conversation about race and racism. <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. I'm not sure we've been engaged in any discussions. Maybe we've been engaged in a lecture about race and about racism for the last six months. You've probably had discussions at home, at school or at work, and in those conversations you've probably heard the term white privilege. Yes. Yes, I have. You may have even had this term used in a way that felt like an insult or an accusation. Let me guess. It isn't. Others will have told you that it's all just made up to make white people feel bad and none of this is right. Right, so my problem here is, yeah, and I'm going to use the term even though people don't like it and they, they try to gaslight you when you use the term gaslighting. He is gaslighting here. He's an articulate psychologist and an ex-NBA star. He's pretty much done it all. He's really a clever person and he's giving a nuanced description of what he feels uh, Black Lives Matter is and uh, what white privilege is. And he goes into it in great detail and does a lot of very clever things. Being a psychologist, I think he knows what he's doing. He's being a bit disingenuous because the first thing right off the bat, he says that it's not made up. So there are no instances of people uh, accusing you of white privilege that are just made up to make you feel bad. Uh, that that never happens. That's, this is gaslighting, you know. It's trying to make you create some kind of cognitive dissonance between your experiences and what really happened. And just before that as well, he said it sometimes feels like uh, an accusation or an insult. Um, and, and none of this is right, no? So it's not... Nobody uses the term white privilege um, as an insult or as an accusation. I mean, that's ridiculous. Of course they do. Of course there are people who will say white privilege to you to end a conversation with you, to make you feel like you don't have a comeback. Yeah, it's white privilege you don't understand. It's obscurantism. It's like saying, well, you can never really understand anything because you're white. And that is, uh, in, in many, in, on many occasions, that is a kind of passive aggressive way of, of uh, stifling uh, another person from having an opinion. Uh, and what he's doing here is gaslighting you even further by saying, you just don't understand. That's not what was happening to you. You weren't being accused. You weren't being insulted. You just don't understand what was happening to you. Privilege is a hard concept for people to understand because normally when we talk of privilege, we imagine immediate unearned riches and tangible benefits for anyone who has it. So here, like I say, uh, he's an articulate, intelligent man, clearly, and... Um, and I think he's making a good point here. Obviously, one of the quick comebacks is, well, I'm white and I came from a poor council estate and whatever, which is just, if if you're an intelligent person, you understand that that is not what privilege means. So fair enough, I'm going to say he's making a very good point here. Let's Let's listen to him. But white privilege, and indeed all privilege, is actually more about the absence of inconvenience, the absence of an impediment or challenge. And as such, when you have it, you really don't notice it. But when it's absent, it affects everything you do. There are lots of types of privilege out there. The privilege of being born into a wealthy family versus a poor family is kind of obvious. But then there's the privilege of being able-bodied versus having or acquiring a disability that most of us take for granted. As I've said a couple of times already in this video, he's very clever, very articulate, and he's got some really good ways of expressing what he wants to express. So here he launches himself into an analogy about able-bodied and disabled people and talking about what an obvious um, uh, privilege it is to be able-bodied uh, and, and, and the disabled person, uh, even though through no fault of the people who are able-bodied, uh, does not have that privilege that an able-bodied person has. And uh, he, says, he says it's very obvious when we look at something like being born into a rich family or being, being born into a poor family. Well, how do we solve that in modern social democracies? Well, we have a progressive tax system. So what is he suggesting we do to solve the white privilege problem? And this is where it gets pretty dark. He doesn't say it here, but he's intelligent enough to know what I'm getting at and what critics of the Black Lives Matter movement are getting at here. What is their end game? Uh, because that's how we solve the problem between rich and poor, so that we don't accumulate uh, too many 
uh, losers uh, in society at the bottom, uh, we have a progressive tax system. So there's a safety net. And this analogy between able-bodied and disabled, I don't think is very helpful either. For obvious reasons. When we're talking about the problem that we're talking about. It's not a helpful analogy. It's a kind of analogy a racist person might make. I don't know if he's doing this knowingly or not, but he's an intelligent, well-read guy. Uh, so... Hmm. I have two very close friends who are wheelchair users, and I'll be honest, when I first met them, I was completely ignorant about the everyday ways their lives are made harder through no fault of their own. Some of these ways are simply thoughtless, but some of them are just the way we live, just the way we build infrastructure, just the way everything works that just makes their life harder than mine. So surely you can see where the analogy starts to get problematic here. I mean, you're comparing people who cannot walk up steps um, to what we're talking about here. I mean, what is the suggestion? What's the suggestion? Because, you know, I don't think this is a helpful way of looking at the world. I, I, you know, I just don't. What's the suggestion and what's the solution? I know what I think he's suggesting. And I know, I think I know what solution he put in place. And uh, it's, it's not pretty. That's just one of the ways that I'm privileged. And understanding that, embracing that, doesn't make me a bad person. Uh, yeah, I think it does make you a bad person if you embrace the idea that members of other races are incapable of living in the same world as you. Personally, I think that makes you a racist. Also, a very subtle psychological trick there in the suggestion that if you don't embrace this way of thinking, you are a bad person. Again, not sure how intentional that is from this uh, guy who has a degree in psychology. But ignoring it raises the chance that my friends will be excluded in ways that are not obvious to me. And as their friend, I can't allow that. Again, this very subtle and at the same time I feel very dangerous suggestion that it's not enough to be good yourself or not do harm to others. You have to be actively not allowing bad things to happen. This collective mindset rather than individualist mindset, which uh, again, uh, very subtly, never sounds good. Individualist always sounds bad and collectivist always sounds, oh good, I'm worried about the group. Um, it's kind of like this thing about it's not enough to be not racist, you have to be anti-racist. Uh, well, okay. Uh, it's kind of like when uh, <laughs> Stalin would shoot the first person who stopped clapping. Um, maybe that's an analogy too far. There's a good chance as a white person watching this, your life is already hard. Every day you have to overcome some difficulty or challenge just to get by. But you can still have white privilege. Yeah, but this is the problem with intersectionality, isn't it? I mean, you've got so many factors that make up your personality. You know, your sex, your gender, your race, uh, your sexual orientation, uh, your, your intelligence, uh, your, your, phys you know, your physical appearance, uh, your height, your strength. Um, all of these things are factors um, the, the, your, your extroversion, your introversion, like your psychological makeup, um, your health, all of these things uh, go into this intersectional diagram which make it absolutely impossible to judge whether one person is more privileged than another. And uh, he seems to understand that. You know, he seems to be talking here about how, yeah, obviously white people can have difficult lives. Well, if you understand that, then obviously you must understand that not all, not all, um, not all members of one race or, or of one axis along the intersectional graph can be put into the same group and you can only judge people individually. The, the incredible thing about intersectional, the intersectional way of looking at the world is that it contradicts itself because absolutely no person is identical to another person even if they belong to the same group. You just can't put people into groups.
not black, not white, not women, not men, not gay, not straight. It doesn't work. We're individuals. White privilege doesn't mean you haven't worked hard or you don't deserve the success you've had. It doesn't mean that your life isn't hard or that you've never suffered. It simply means that your skin color has not been the cause of your hardship or suffering. Sorry to bring this up again, but yeah, it can mean that if you're a white farmer in Zimbabwe or a white farmer in South Africa for that matter uh, at the moment. That's something that uh, isn't being brought up very much in the news, but uh, yeah. Yeah, your skin colour can be a problem there. There is nothing but a benefit to understanding our own privileges, white and otherwise. It brings us closer to those who are different. It helps us be vigilant about the ways we treat others different than us. It helps us make a society that is fairer and more equal. Treating people as individuals makes society more equal. Treating people as collectives makes society more segregated. He's wrong either intentionally or unintentionally, John Amici is wrong. Having white privilege doesn't make your life easy, but understanding it can help you realize why some people's lives are harder than they should be. As I came to the end of his speech there, it, it almost sounds like he's defeated his own argument. Like, it, that's how I felt. I think um, particularly a young person looking at this would take it very very differently and basically what they're going to take away from from this is that <laughs> one race has a harder time all the time and another has it easy even though he doesn't say that and he kind of uh, almost backtracks on the whole idea of white privilege it that's what someone's going to take away from that. You know, couldn't, wouldn't the message just be better and clearer if we just said, look, be nice to people. Do unto others as, <laughs> do unto others as uh, whatever, as you wish to be done unto you or whatever is the, uh, the phrase from the Bible. Um, that's, the, yeah, there's my two cents on the thing. Uh, Treat everyone as an individual. If you happen to know they're gay, you don't know anything about them. If they're straight, you don't know anything about them. If they're black or white or a woman or a man or transgender, you don't know anything about them until you sit down and have a conversation with them. And even then, <laughs> they can still be an arsehole.